Now, in its traditional form, Ugo Twila is a collusive strategy used by willing lovers to secure marriage negotiations. But over the years, the practice has mutated. It's now often used to sexually exploit girls and young women, particularly in rural parts of the country. Statistics two years ago show that child marriage involving girls aged between 12 and 17 is rife in South Africa. In KwaZulu-Natal alone, over 25,000 young women have been married, divorced, separated, widowed, or are living with a partner or a husband. KwaZulu-Natal has the highest number recorded in the country, followed by Gauteng with 15,000 women. To talk about when culture clashes with gender rights, Professor Deirdre Byrne from UNISA's Institute for Gender Studies joins us now on the line. A very good evening to you, Professor, and thank you so much for joining us. Do we have latest figures on this practice countrywide? I must tell you that we actually do not have the very latest figures. The latest ones that I had were from 2017, which showed that a total of 95,000 women, young women under the age of 18, were either married or divorced or widowed or living with a partner as a husband and wife. Mm. So now, according to the United Nations Children's Fund, Generation 2030 Africa report, child marriage rates in Africa have decreased. Does that reality bear out? In South Africa, I don't think so. So w what is the picture? Is it true that one in three women are reportedly married before the age of 18? Yes, I think it is true. So what is the picture? What are... Which provinces are the biggest offenders of this practice? Can you expand a little bit more, please? So, um, as you mentioned in your introduction, Kwazulu Natal is still the biggest offender as far as that's concerned, followed by Gauteng. Um, and, I mean, I find that very interesting because it's often said that early child marriage, early marriage, um, increases and is supported in areas where there's a high population of people in rural areas. But Gauteng is, of course, highly urbanized, so it indicates that people are still getting married very, very early, even although the society is so urbanized. We would, we would think that there wouldn't be such an adherence to cultural practices. Hmm. So, I mean, I did mention the fact that the practice itself has mutated, so it's being corrupted to an extent. So in Gauteng, what do you think would be the biggest motivators? Uh, uh, you once wrote an article saying Ugo Twyla, the sex trafficking scandal devastating rural South Africa. So as you say, clearly it has uh, migrated even to the urban areas. It really has. And I, I think, you know, South Africa is not doing very well economically, not to put your final point in it. And in such situations, the, it's always the poorest people who suffer the most and people who are desperate for money. So I believe that people, uh, that um, parents, as it were, sell off their underage daughters in order to get money because there is also this, this um, presumption that girls are not very lucrative. So having a daughter is not going to bring mm. money to the family, whereas having a son will. So then the thing to do with the daughter is to sell her off to the highest bidder, so to speak. Mm. So are we saying that Ubu Twilight necessarily goes hand in hand with other offences like kidnapping, sexual assault and human trafficking? Well, Ubu Twilight is by definition a form of abduction, although it did start as a way of um, a couple of eloping if they couldn't get parental consent. It has, it has since mutated into the situation where young girls are being abducted by men, which is a form of trafficking in persons, and it is a form of child marriage. And quite, and although, although the young man who abducts the young woman is not supposed to have sex with her until she, her parents have given consent for the marriage, it often happens also that um, the young, young girl is also raped before the marriage takes place. So there's a lot of mm. nefarious practices going on and being associated with this. I mean, there'd be many drives to actually ensure that culture is not corrupted. So those who are practicing it, do they see it as that, as a form of a kidnapping? I mean, as I said earlier on, that it's collusive, as in there is agreement for a greater good. But do they see the danger and the vulnerability of young women through that kidnapping practice? I think, um, I think, 
quite sharply divided. I think the men who do it don't see it as that. But I think for the young women who are the victims of the practice, they do. And I would imagine some of their parents also do, in fact. Mm. So I think, it's, I think it's one of those unfortunate things that emphasizes and deepens the gender divide rather than actually trying to heal it or bring about reconciliation. Mm. It would be really nice if we could all, at all acknowledge that we love our daughters and want to cherish them. But I don't think that's, I don't think that's um, there's universal agreement on that. So in February of 2014, a 28-year-old man from the Eastern Cape was sentenced to 22 years in prison for rape, human trafficking and assault linked to Ugo Twyla. Are we seeing more and more of this, people being prosecuted for this practice that is uh, obviously illegal? Yes, well, it is illegal. And in fact, it's even been made illegal in, um, it's also been made illegal in the Eastern Cape where it's quite prevalent. And in fact, the, the current legislation dictates that a police person must arrest anybody who's even accused of Ukutwala. So, I mean, the, the, there is harsher legislation in place, and so we will, I think, see more and more arrests mm. of this kind. We're seeing more and more arrests, but does that include the families? Because in this particular case, a 14-year-old was sold uh, to him by her family for 8,000 rand. And you spoke earlier on of families engaging in this. Are they facing or getting prosecuted? Families, will, families generally don't get prosecuted, no. It generally will be the abductor who gets prosecuted. That's the other problem with Ukutwala, and in fact with early child marriage, is that it's not just a one, one criminal act. It's an act with many people responsible, often the girl's family, sadly to say. Hmm. So we're speaking about the criminalization of it, the practice that's been incorporated into the Trafficking in Persons Act. Some people still see it as a normal form of tradition and custom, as you said. How do we change attitudes? How do we educate people that this is unlawful? I don't think telling people that it's unlawful is really going to work because I think that your dad in the world traditionalist is going to say, well, you know, your law is not part of my culture. I think that's a, that's a probably a fairly, fairly well-used argument. I think the, the argument has to be made from humanity and let's reverse the situation. Let's imagine if somebody kidnapped your son or, or you know, a gang of women Came to, to, came to your house and ran off with your 12-year-old son and forced him to live as a sex slave. I mean, how would, how would that be? Mm. I think that might be the way. Because if you, if you reverse these gender injustices, I think that's a way for people to see how, how it would affect them, maybe. Then the other, the other thing is to bring it home, bring it into people's faces. How would you feel if that was your daughter who was, being abducted at the age of eight or ten, and suddenly becoming somebody's wife, um, you know, how would how would that be? How would you feel about your daughter's prospects for education, a meaningful, meaningful and fulfilled life? So basically, we're saying it still draws down to the status and social standing of women and children, especially girl children in society. Yes, I do think so. And I do think, unfortunately, girl children are not prized as much as boy children. And I, mean, I think that's very regrettable because, you know, children all have a right to life and children are all a wonderful gift from, from the divine. So we ought to cherish them all equally. So from a policy perspective, what is missing to help protect women and girl children further? We've got quite extensive legislation. I mean, we've got the pre even the Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act is, is very, very up to date. What is missing is implementation, and I think what what that also boils down to is um, human resources and capacity to do the persecution and the arrests and bring those who are arrested actually to justice. Mm. I mean, given the digital world that we're living in, it's become even more and more easier to lure young girls and, and find them victims of Ugutwala. 
but also as human trafficking. So how do we attack it, so to speak, from that perspective? Have we the laws to help prosecute people, especially on these medium, digital platforms? No, we actually don't. We don't have... I mean, I think there are anti-pornography laws, but we're seeing an increase in visits to pornography sites by young children under, you know, certainly under 18, under 15, under 14, and so on. Um, They're using pornography sites more and more, and I think... I really think it comes down to parents and parenting. I think parents need to be very vigilant with this kind of sites that their children are, are visiting and the sort of things that they're doing on social media. Just a final question. If we're saying this is a global and national disgrace, the fact that Ugutwala has been corrupted and is being exploited by child or human traffickers or uh, traffickers and persons, are we doing enough in terms of programs that are there to support young children? Because I'd imagine that surely this has an impact on uh, the growth of a country, the contribution to GDP. If you force a young girl out of school and uh, who then is not able to uh, learn and develop themselves, that it must surely have some impact on the economy. Are the programs to not only monitor this, but to support them? There aren't, there aren't any programs to monitor this. I mean, it should be, should really be a very substantial audit by not only statistics, but also the law of, um, early, of childhood marriages of, and of Ukutwala as well. I don't see there's a political will to do that, actually. Thank you so much for joining us. Professor Deirdre Byrne, chairperson of the, of UNISA Africa Gold Development Program. Shantay?